you know, there's great deals out there and you can get started with basically nothing down. You just need to make sure that, all right, here's what the cost will be every single month. I'm pretty sure I could rent it in the first month, but let me budget it where I know I might have eight months or so of kind of iffy rentals. You've got that situated, you're basically golden. Hey everyone, Jamel Gibbs here. Welcome to another podcast episode. Today we have another special guest. Uh, he has the Stephen, the Stephen Carlson show. If you haven't uh, seen it on YouTube yet, check it out. Uh, he reached out to me a couple months ago. Uh, we've been communicating ever since. Uh, really great guy. Uh, and I know that you guys are going to enjoy what we're going to talk about today. Now, today I decided to have Stephen come on uh, primarily because he specializes in multiple facets of the real estate business. Uh, he's been doing real estate just as long as I have. Um, so I, I specifically look for people who are actually doing the business, number one, but have the experience. Now, if, you know, let's, let, let's say, for example, if someone's been doing a business for five years, but they've had a lot of success in doing what they do, yeah, then they qualify, right? I want to make sure that somebody's actually doing what they say that they're doing uh, when I invite them onto the show so that we can provide you with what's actually working and the best information from someone who's experienced in the field. So that's what this uh, podcast is all about, guys. And, and that's why you know, I, I invited Steven on. Every single guest that you see that comes onto this show, they are the real deal. And that's what this podcast is. It's about real deal, real estate investing, uh, boots in the ground, stuff that actually works. Uh, now, like I said, Steven's been doing a business. He took a break from the business uh, for a little while but he still has the knowledge that you guys need in order to get from where you are right now to where you want to go in the real estate business. Um, today, we're gonna talk about uh, how you can get started in multifamily investing. Now, we're not talking about commercial real estate investing. Uh, we're talking about uh, one to four units, okay? Really, two to four units would be considered multifamily, okay? Uh, if you ask, Another investor, they may have a different opinion on that, but we're not talking about apartment buildings. We're not talking about small apartment complexes. We're talking about residential multifamily investing, not commercial. And just for your knowledge, uh, if you're brand new to real estate, uh, anything above, I believe it's uh, five units, five units or more, really six units or more will be considered uh, commercial real estate. Uh, you can get a residential loan from uh, on a property if it's uh, comprised of one to four units, all right? Just so you know, for your own personal knowledge. So what that means is uh, you can get an FHA loan, let's just say if your credit is you know less than 620, you can still get an FHA loan. You just might have to put down a little bit more money, but you can get an FHA loan on a property uh, a residential FHA loan on any property from one to four units uh, with 3% down or 5% down or whatever the case may be. Uh, anything above four units, okay, five units or more, you have to put 20% down. So that's a big uh, differentiator there for a lot of people to get started in the business. Uh, you know, you could have 10, let's say uh, you, you, you find a four unit for, Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and you know, you decided that you wanted to invest in that particular property. That's a big differentiator right there, as far as uh, money that you need available for you in order to purchase that type of property. Three percent versus twenty percent, just for having one extra unit. So I think it's a great way to get started uh, in multi residential multifamily investing. For the average investor, uh, yes, you can get involved in these uh, types of deals with very little money out of pocket if you negotiate with the seller uh, via terms. But if we're talking about the bare basics of real estate investing, then uh, this is a great way to get started. Uh, get used to owning units, and then you can start stepping into the commercial world as your income grows. You add more equity into your properties. You pull some equity. You put it down on a on a, a larger unit, et cetera, et cetera. That's how you build real wealth in real estate. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. Now, Stephen, uh, uh, Stephen Carlson has been in the business 
like I said, just as long as I have, uh, then he took a break. He started a tech company uh, and then he decided to jump right back into the market. And he has a financial channel on, uh, on YouTube. You guys definitely want to check it out. It's called the Stephen Carlson show. Great, great channel. Uh, I love the content that, that he's putting out and I know you guys are going to love it as well. Stephen Carlson. What's up, man? Hey man, what's up? I'm doing great, man. How are you? I doing well, doing well. That's excellent, man. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have you on a, on a show, man. Um, looking forward to uh, all of the content that we're going to talk about today and uh, uh, just kind of uh, getting an idea, picking your brain uh, to get an idea of what you're actually doing right now, man. So uh, why don't you tell us all, a little bit about yourself? Sure. I got started in real estate back in the end of 2000. It was middle of 2002. And um, I had just returned from the Navy and I was back to civilian life. I was in the Tampa Bay area and I was working for a group of foreclosure flippers. And I kind of started off just doing various errands for them, honestly. But I learned the business pretty quickly. In about six months of working with them, I went out and searched for my own deals and I came back to them. You know, they basically were my investors and said, hey guys, you know, I've got these deals. How about we work together? And the first, say, dozen or so deals I worked with them as my investors, I was able to sock away enough cash that after about a year into it, I was doing my own deals and only if I was going to be overextended when I go back to an investor and say, hey, you know, could you guys help me out on this? But then I very quickly started getting houses and they were all, you know, the 75,000, 100,000, maybe like 120,000 easy single family homes that I could buy, fix up, flip, get a good family in there and move on to the next. And I was just doing that, rocking and rolling for about two years on my own. I did a little over 150 of my own houses and pure luck. I took my profit out just before everything started going, you know, down the tubes mm. and I started my tech business. And I don't want to say that I was a psychic or that I had any special knowledge. It was pure luck that I just took my money out at the right time. And I was able to ride through the downturn in the real estate market. And then about two years ago, I came back to it saying, Hey, I've made all this money in my tech business. I can take that and start investing more into properties. Got it, man. So, uh, you know, you didn't experience that down cycle that we had uh, 12 years ago. You, you were fortunate. Yeah, like I said, it was pure luck. You know, yeah. I'm not saying that I was some genius. It was just pure luck. I just lucked out of it. Yeah, I wish I, I you know, I took a hit back then, man. So I, I know exactly, you know, I, I wish, I know exactly how it feels for, for, those of who, yep. for those who have been in the business for a while to take that hit. And, um, oh, yeah. you know, just, you know, I, I, you know, I look at it as a, a good experience because at the end of the day, if I'm looking at my business now uh, and the situation that we're in uh, with worldly conditions at the moment, you know, yep. at, the, at the end of the day, it really prepared me for something like this. So definitely, I, I completely think. agree. Yeah, man. So, you know, you, you ended up in, in a real estate business. Why did you start off in, in the single family flipping niche? Was it, was it because... Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, just honestly, at that time, the group that I started working with, that's what they were doing. Okay. You know, I was fresh out of the Navy. I had no idea what I was doing. You know, I just found luckily a good set of mentors. And this, remember, this was long before YouTube, before you could get resources. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, there were some of those like DVD sets that you could buy, like the, the late night infomercial DVD sets. Yeah. But other than that, there was really no source of information out there. You basically either had to figure it out on your own and screw up a lot or hopefully be mentored and kind of work with somebody else that knew the industry. And most people were not willing to share their knowledge. Yep. So if you wanted to work, you know, and learn from them, you almost kind of had to learn on the side without them realizing that you were paying attention to it. I mean, that is so true because, you know, when I started, you know, a lot of people ask me who mentored you and, you know, how did you get, I honestly, I didn't have a mentor. I kind of, I just rolled up my sleeves and I figured it out as I went on. You did it the hard way. Yep. I did it the hard way. And I didn't know because I didn't know about the information space back then. It wasn't like right. it is today. Everybody's a guru today. Right. So <laughs> yeah, I understand, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's kind of what I, why I said that earlier on the podcast, you know, there's guys who are literally, uh, who've never, they probably done one deal and they're out here teaching people how to do this. Or they've wholesaled one or two deals and that's yeah, about it. I don't agree with that. And, and then, you know, unfortunately people, 
Um, they don't know what to believe, but these good, these, a lot of these guys are such great marketers that they'll make yep. you believe that they, they've been doing it for so long. And, and then they, you know, unfortunately, well, and they were also making, they were making money when everything was easy. That too. You know, everybody's an expert when, it, when the economy is great. Exactly. You know, someone that they can actually make money right now when the economy is kind of, you know, it, yep. it sucks. You know, those are the people that know what's going on. Exactly, man. In fact, you know, you know, you look at a company like mine, here's the difference between someone who's experienced and who's not, you know, during this whole, uh, the last six months with this, with this pandemic going on, you know, we've done better than ever. In fact, these last couple yep. of weeks, we've done close to a hundred thousand dollars in, you know, in, in, in August, basically. So right. it's just a, a good time to be in real estate. If you know what you're doing. Uh, oh yeah. And, and like I, right now I'm snapping up properties like crazy okay. and between exactly, you know, if you have the money and, and you know, I had the luxury from busting my butt for years in my tech industry, you know, I had the money sitting, not literally in a checking account, but I basically had cash available to me. Mm -hmm. You know, some of it I could borrow against some of my other properties. Some of it I had it in stocks. So I did a killing off of Tesla stock. So I was able to pull a little bit of money out of there and I'm just seeing great deals that I know, you know, and we'll get into some of the, you know, how I'm finding the properties, but I know that even if there's six months or a year of kind of iffy rental market, I know I can ride through that and next year and the year after and the next five years, 10 years, I'm going to be doing great on those deals. Yeah, man. So it's, I feel like it's our responsibility. We're the experienced real estate investors. We want to provide with, uh, the, the, the uh, general public with great information that they can actually use, stuff that's time. Right. So let's talk about some, uh, some uh, investing strategies that you're using right now. Now, I know you, you, you've done strip malls. I know you've done you know, apartments mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Uh, today, I really wanted to focus primarily on residential multi-units one to four yep one to four exactly or i guess two to four yeah yeah i was gonna say that uh, really multi-unit would be two to four units so uh why is this a great way to uh start building up a rental portfolio well, you have so many different options when you get, whether it's a one to four, or if you want the multifamily two to four there, you know, you were mentioning before the FHA loans, if you, as an investor, if you can come up with three and a half percent down, even if your credit is not perfect, it just has to not be horrible. As long as it's, you know, average credit score, you can get an FHA loan. That's a fixed rate for 30 years. You move into the property and we'll get to how to find them in a little bit, but you can move into the property with like less than 4% down three and a half plus your closing costs. And sometimes you can even wrap your closing costs into it. You can live in that property for one year, rent out your other one or two units, depending on what you get, that money that's coming in from your rental will pay your mortgage. FHA only requires that you live in that property for one year. One year later, you can go buy a second one, rent out the first one completely, and just keep rinse and repeat that process over and over. Somebody that's young and just getting started in that, you can do that three, four, five times and build up a multi-million dollar portfolio very, very easily. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, what you're doing is house hacking at that point. Exactly. I had a friend, you know, and this is one of the guys who inspired me to get started in real estate when he went to, uh, what's the name of that college in Richmond, Virginia? Um, is it Hampton? Hampton University? Uh, there's I mean, a couple of them in Richmond, yeah. He, uh, I'm trying to remember which one he went to, but he went to a college and uh, it was a university. VCU's out there and yeah, I, I think there's was, a couple, but yeah. I think it was Hampton. Hampton, I believe okay. it was. But uh, he went to Hampton. This is years ago because he's, he's, uh, he has me by at least six, seven years. But um. He said he bought his first property while he was in college. Rather than living in a right. dorm, he lived in a property and rented out the other half of the property. Uh, so that he was actually living rent free while he was in college. And That's how I did it. Actually, my very first condo. Yep. Wow. Did man. the same thing. And now it was it was a two bedroom condo. Now it was a buddy of mine, but I rented out his room for the exact cost of my mortgage every month, and everything was fine. Yeah, and now this guy, he has millions of dollars worth of properties in Brooklyn, New York, and, and in uh, Atlanta as well. And, you know, it's because he started, this is, we're talking 25 years ago, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's a great way, especially if you're young right now, 
looking to get yeah, you're in your early 20s you're not married or even if you are married you can still do it but it's it's simpler if it's just you and you can easily bounce yep. around without the commitments of a family and kids exactly exactly man so let's talk about some of the you know a lot of people wonder you know there's a lot of misconceptions that go on in in understanding real estate you need a lot of money you um you know you need great credit uh yeah what what's some of the biggest misconceptions that you're finding well you know you have, there's so many different options you can do like the fha like we said if you want if you have the three and a half percent down but let's say you don't have that money down then you can also look for ones where you're going to do seller financing or a um, you know a um, seller held note where basically the owner of the property is the bank for you and those are some of my favorite deals. You can find properties that have been owned by, you know, individuals and they've owned it for 10, 15, 20 years. They've already paid off their mortgage. And many times they've either like if I'm further up north, but you know, people will retire and move south or something. So they still own their investment properties up north. They don't want to deal with it. And if somebody comes to them, approaches them and says, Hey, look, I will pay you X dollars and I will pay you that over every single month for the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever, you know, that's sometimes a very good option for these people. You know, it's better for their tax advantage. They don't have to worry about, you know, if basically if they don't owe any money on the property, if they sell it outright, they have to pay all the taxes on that profit. Right. But if they finance it for you, there's a lot less tax ramifications. And of course, you know, I'm not a tax lawyer, you're not either. So people definitely need to talk to their CPA. Mm -hmm. But as a general thing, it is a great deal for someone that's owned the property for many years that just doesn't really want to deal with it anymore. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. And like Steven said, definitely talk to your CPA or accountant to uh, get more information on how to structure your, your game plan moving mm -hmm. forward when it comes to owning real estate. But there are some benefits to actually having yep. a mortgage on a property uh, and you get taxed a lot less when you, when you, when it's not free and clear, believe it or not. Right. So, um, you know, we have this mindset shift that people may have. So if you've never owned a property before, you're just looking to get started. What are some of the mental things then people need to shift in their brain in order to make this happen. I think a lot of people get confused with basically like, when you first get your mortgage or if you've ever had a person buy a house and they're a friend of yours and you've looked at some of their closing documents that says, you know, you bought the house for $150,000, but then there's the truth and lending statement that will say after the 30 years, you're going to pay $300,000 or whatever the amount is. And people freak out thinking, oh my God, I'm really paying twice the amount of the property. But you actually need to kind of step back for a second and think of actually how the numbers are really working on this. That and let's try and keep this without getting into a huge math lesson, but you have the beauty of borrowing money today at today's low interest rates, locking that interest rate in for the next 30 years. And as inflation goes up, you're borrowing the money today, but you're paying it off with tomorrow's cheaper money. Mm. And it, it, I know that can be a little confusing there, but when a property starts appreciating at four, five, six, seven percent per year, and you're only paying three percent to the bank, you know, th there, there's a little difference. The property value is going up far more than what you're paying to the bank. And I think a lot of people just get so confused and like, oh my God, I need, a, I need to pay extra, you know, an extra $150 every day, you know, I mean, every month on my mortgage to pay that mortgage down. And they're not really sitting back and just thinking the overall picture of, you know, you could take that money and invest it into a second property that could appreciate it at a greater value as well, rather than just paying off that loan. I think people just get so worried about, oh my God, I'm in debt. I owe all this money. And they don't really think the whole process through. Right. And, you know, just to kind of uh, add on some more to what you're, you're saying, uh, basically, you know, here's my philosophy on the whole thing. Who cares if someone else is paying off the property for you anyway? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you've got a renter, they're paying your payment. Yeah. So I, you know, at that point I'll pay any price as long as it pays for itself. You know, yep. I'm going to build equity over time. I'm going to be able to do things with the equity. If I ever sell the property, I'm getting all that money back anyway. So it doesn't really, yep. and like, that's the key is, is, is yep. enjoying all that equity. 
Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, when you sell, owning a property, in my opinion, uh, a rental property is almost like having a bank account that grows itself, you know, because yeah. when you sell the property, you're going to be able to pull all that money back out and do something else with it. So yeah, I, you know, when it comes to the numbers and things like that, yeah, you're going to pay interest, but it's the cost of doing business at the end of the day, because right. You know, you have to pay someone. Someone else is giving you the money to purchase an asset. You're going to pay interest on it. And then at the end of the day, you're going to be able to get your uh, portion out of it when you sell. Or even if you, uh, you know, I have one student who's getting $500 a month in, in cash flow off of a property. Mm -hmm. After everything, he puts uh, $500 a month in his pocket. So you can make yep. money every month that can pay a car note, that can pay a cell phone bill, it can possibly pay your mortgage, you know, but these are things that, uh, these are the benefits of owning real estate. It's how you create real wealth. So yes, talking about uh, uh, two to four unit properties here, uh, what are some of the obstacles people may face when it comes to um, getting started in this type of investment? Part of it in the beginning is finding the property. You know, obviously you can go on Zillow, you can go on LoopNet, you can go on Redfin. There's, there's tons of websites. The problem that I have with most of those, and I, I search those every day because you'll find, you know, the diamond in the rough, but the majority of the time when you find those properties, they're being sold at market value. Mm -hmm. Or if they're not at market value, there's a very good reason why they're not at market value. Um, and I'm not afraid of buying something that needs work, but a lot of times they kind of get cherry picked before they make it to there. So it's once they're already posted on MLS, it's a less likely chance you're gonna get an amazing deal. You may get a good deal, but you're not gonna get an amazing right. deal. So do you, do you think that purchasing uh, properties that need work, uh, you know, would that type of investment be better for someone versus someone uh, something that you're going to pay full market value for? Well, yes, no, and maybe they're, they're both different angles. If you are handy and you are capable of doing a lot of the work yourself, me, you never want to trust me with a hammer. I will break something. I have many talents. Fixing things is not one of them, but I do have the knowledge. So when I hire someone to do it, I know if they're BSing me or not. I know how much time it should take and I know what it should be like when it's done. And I know quality. I just don't know how to do it myself. I'm just bad with tools. So if you're willing to put in the energy and do it, like if it's your first place and you're willing to, you know, on the nights and the weekends, go in there and rip up the old carpet, fix the drywall holes, repaint the place, put in some new cabinets, and you're willing to do all that sweat equity yourself, you are going to save a ton of money as long as you're willing to, hey, it might take a month, it might take three months, it might take six months, it might take a year, depending on how much time you can put into it. But you could easily save twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars off of that property just on that one unit. If you're even just buying a single unit, you could save that much money on yep. it. And you do that over a two or a four unit place, and you know you fix one up, you rent that out, you fix up the next one, you rent that out. You could keep doing that over a one year period and have an amazing property that you easily doubled or tripled your investment in That's in right. one year. That's right. You know, one, one of my philosophies is to purchase it in a distressed condition. It could be financial or yep. physical distress, right? Um, if the property is in physical distress, I want to get in with as little down as possible. Try to get the owner to finance it or try to get the, try to just pay for it cash. And just, if I'm paying cash for a property, I'm paying like 30 or 50 cents on a dollar for it. Oh, right? Of course, you're getting a steal on it, of course. You're getting a steal on it at, at that point. And like you said, uh, put a little bit of money into the first apartment, rent it out. Put a little bit yep. of, take that money from the rent, put it into the next unit. And then keep doing that until the, until the entire property is done. You got a nice property at the end of the day, and then you'll be able to, uh, the property value goes up, and then you'll be able to really cash in on the equity uh, of the property to buy your next one. So it's just a- Oh, great. And most properties that I purchase are in need of some sort of work, whether it's been poorly managed and you need to get a better management team in there to run the place. Because I also do larger apartment buildings as well. So this is kind of applies to a one to four, but it applies more on larger ones. If it's just been poorly managed, 
Um, if it needs construction work, I love those properties because you can, you know, it's very hard to sell a property on the open market to, you know, a family with kids if the place smells like cat pee. You know, <laughs> I walk into a house, it's stupid as it sounds. I, I, if I smell the place and it stinks, I know that's money. So I love those houses. Yeah, Whereas I know that I can get a huge discount because you know, you're not going to get, you know, a husband and wife and three kids move into that house. Right. So you're not going to get the premium price. Now I, I will buy properties that are full retail value. You know, there was one that I bought last year and the only reason why I paid full retail value for it was I already owned the other three houses mm -hmm. on the block and I just wanted the rest of the one in the middle. So basically if you rented, you rented from me. That makes sense. So it was, I already bought the, the three ugly ones on the, on the block and I bought the one nice one. Now it wasn't overly expensive. It was just the going rate. Right. So now I owned all four of the properties that were on that street. Now you own a block, man. And that's what, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it, man. So, you know, there's some, some things that people need to be mindful of when they get started in the business. What, what are, what are some things that you feel like people need to keep in mind? Well, Obviously, like you hit on the beginning of this video is the current, you know, it, everybody knows the pandemic's going on. That's obvious. You know, you need to make sure whatever you do, whether you're house hacking and living in one of the units and fixing it up or whether you're buying it outright or whatever your options are, make sure that you've got at least the ability to cover that thing for one year, whatever the situation is, because what I would really hate is for someone to get in on a great deal, be three months into it and not completely added up all the numbers. And next thing you know, now they have to ditch the thing and lose money. You know, there's great deals out there and you can get started with basically nothing down. You just need to make sure that, all right, here's what the cost will be every single month. I'm pretty sure I could rent it in the first month, but let me budget it where I know I might have eight months or so of kind of iffy rentals. You've got that situated. You're basically golden. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. I, I love that because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that's some advice that a friend of mine gave to me years ago. His name is Steve as well, ironically, but he's in a- Must be a great guy. <laughs> he is a great guy. Um, he said, make sure whenever you're going to hold on to properties, you have a slush fund for that particular yep. property. You know, even on a single family property, you, you want to have at least five grand put to the side in case something goes yep. wrong. Right. So uh, I, I've always taken that and uh, I multiply that number. So if I have four units, I want to make sure I have twenty thousand dollars in there in the bank at all. Yes. Times. Or, or at least have some sort of exit, exit strategy where, you know, hey, I wanted to keep this as a rental, but something happened and you plan. OK, I know if X, Y and Z takes place. OK, I'm going to sell the place. I'll sell it for this amount. I'll get out of it and I'll be fine. You can have an exit strategy that's not your ultimate goal, but at least you've had a backup plan. That's right. That's right, man. Uh, a, B, C plan all the time. Man. Exactly. So I don't care who you are. You know, there, I get properties that, you know, sometimes things surprise me and I'm like, oh, damn, you know, <laughs> now, but I had a plan B, I had a plan C. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you work down through a lot more letters, but, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're, we're talking about, you know, uh, two, multifamily, two to four units. And, yes. um, uh, you mentioned just a couple minutes ago and I, and you know, we spoke about owner financing, uh, throughout this, this call as well. You all, uh, a couple minutes ago, you, you mentioned, uh, getting involved with very little money, if any, almost no money down, uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of a broad statement because you technically right. need capital. Uh, it just doesn't have to be a lot. Yeah, there is no, there's no such thing as no money down. Right. I mean, you have, have to have something. It's going to be either yours or somebody else's, but it's going to be something, yes. right? There's so, going to be money there somewhere. So the, so the question is, you know, I just want to get your take on this. Um, how hard is it for the average person to get involved in two to four unit properties if they don't have a lot of money or they don't have a lot of credit at the moment or any, well, let's say they have terrible credit. Um, at yeah. The, uh, what would you do? Honestly, if I was starting out, it was my first one and I, 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 you know, the FHA is a great option, but let's just say you don't have that three and a half percent down. Hey, no harm. I would go out there and I would hustle and find deals. I love seller financed properties. Mm -hmm. And there's so many great ways to find properties. You know, 
even sometimes just stupid things that you can do, contact the local water department yep. and say, hey, can I get a list of all the properties in your area that are multifamily that have not had, you know, or, you know, have had issues, you know, are the, is there any water that's passed due? Are there any properties that, you know, maybe they shut the water off? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, there's no tenants in that building, but if there's no water going to that building and there's an owner somewhere, you, you take that list and you go down the list and if you see, okay, Johnny's Investments LLC, all right, that's a company, don't worry about it. You see, you know, Betsy and Johnny Smith, all right, I'm calling Betsy and Johnny Smith and I'm going to contact them and say, hey, I see you've got this property over here. Do you, are you interested in selling it? And that has been one of the best options on getting properties and it's usually, you know, either they've had it for 10, 15 years, they've moved down south, they live in Florida now, the property's in upstate New York or Pennsylvania or whatever, and they know it's there, they're not stupid, they just, they don't have the energy, they don't have the time, and they right. just don't really care. It doesn't cost them anything, they've already paid off their mortgage, it's just kind of there. And those are some of the best deals that when you contact them and you say, you know, all right guys, I, I would love to get this property, you know, you, you don't, I'm not going to advocate lying to them. You, you don't lie to them, but you don't go and say, Hey, I'm an investor and I want to buy your you know, great deal here. You just come to them humbly and just say, Hey, I'm looking to buy a property in your area. I think this one would be a great one for me to move into and rent out the other units. You know, can we work out a deal where I pay you X dollars per month? Yeah. And those, you know, that's, that's, those are excellent deals that you can get. Absolutely. I think, uh, when if someone doesn't really have a lot of credit or a lot of capital, mm -hmm. they can wholesale as well. Wholesale their way up to, yes. to getting the money or borrow the the down payment from somebody and then, you know, build the equity over time, uh, make that person a partner. Uh, but there's ways of getting started uh, when you don't have the capital, you don't have the money as well. So you, you yeah, like, like in the very beginning, when I got started, I had the investors that I worked for, they helped finance some of the properties. Yeah. And also on the side, obviously, you know, I'm a, I, I do real estate and I do the um, YouTube channels, technology, yeah. etc. On the side, I'm a volunteer paramedic. So I spend a lot of my time in the hospitals where I'm constantly meeting doctors. Yeah. And I don't know if you know many doctors, but doctors have incredibly long schedules they work very, very hard, long shifts. They don't have the time to go out and look for investments, but they make very good money. Yep. So it's very easy to approach some Perfect of them. scenario, and man. Exactly. As you go, hey, doc, you know, I, this is a great deal. Here's the property I'm looking at. You know, let's go in on this. You front the money. I'll do the work for you. Yeah. And, you know, those work out really well as well. Yeah, man. Great way to get started. Great way to build some capital as well. So you, you, you spoke a little bit about, uh, we, we started getting into finding uh, some of the uh, properties and, and I definitely want to talk about that in a little more detail. Um, sure. Why don't we provide our listeners with, a, let's say, a five-step process to get started from, you know, soup to nuts. You know, let's, uh, let's talk about how someone can actually uh, find and close their first deal. Okay. What are some of the yeah, there's mul sure, there's multiple ways of finding a property. And I think it works no matter how you're going to finance it, whether you're FHAing it, whether it's conventional, whether you're getting the money from the doctor or a friend or you have it yourself, you need the deal. It, it doesn't matter how you're financing, you need the property. You know, I mentioned before, sometimes the water department, utilities, you know, you can get some cities will give you that information, some won't. Um, you can do, you know, that's actually also not, not not to cut you off, sure. um, I actually have a video on that as well, but um, okay. that's a great way to verify vacant properties. If you contact the water department and they tell you that, if you get a list of all the properties that have, um, uh, where the water is actually shut off, um, right. chances are either they don't have the money to pay the bill or the property is going to be vacant, right? Just to right. Get, verify the vacancy of a property, you know? Yeah. And that's a, you know, from my opinion, that's a great way. Now, yes, it's nice to have a property that already has tenants, but I like to choose my tenants and I'm pretty selective over who I rent my properties to. Right. And that would be a whole nother discussion, but I'm much rather a place that doesn't have tenants. That way I can put in good quality people that I know are going to pay their rent every month. Mm -hmm. But, um, 
you know, like you were saying, a vacant property is great from the water department. However you find that part of the deal, you have to then approach the person. You know, you, you, when I do deals, you know, I will find 10, 15, 20 deals that are out there that I'm interested in. And then I will contact all of them. And probably, I don't want to say a hard number, but a vast majority of them, either it's not right for them at the moment, they don't want to sell, they're not interested, whatever. You contact them and it's a numbers game. Right. You know, you, if you don't go out there and hustle, you're not going to find deals. You can, you can go on, you know, online and, and search the MLS. Those are all guaranteed that people want to sell the property. But if you really want to get in on the ground floor and find properties, you know, either buy them from a wholesaler, you know, that can, that they've already done a lot of the le- le- great work resource. for you. I'm glad you mentioned that, man. Cause a lot of people skip over actually purchasing from wholesalers because they're, yep. They come into the business thinking as a wholesaler, and I get it, but if you're looking to build a residential portfolio, if you're looking to hold on to properties, wholesalers is probably going to be one of your best uh, resources to find uh, deals outside of you know, other methods as well. But wholesalers are consistently finding discounted properties and they're going to sell it to you. Exactly. And and, you know, there's, there's some things you gotta, you gotta find the good wholesalers and there are some great ones out there. You know, I I know you do wholesaling. There's people that have been doing this for years and really know their stuff. And you find one of those, you keep that as gold. You keep that person and you, you treat them well because they are finding, they're doing all the hustle for you and finding you the deals. You know, you can go out and do the hustle yourself, but it takes work. Mm-hmm. So if you can't or don't want to do that, you got to find someone that can do the hustle for you. So we find the properties. We, uh, you know, we, we spoke about different ways of finding properties. Um, I know we have the vacants. We have, you know, you can buy them through the MLS, which you're probably going to pay a little bit more because of the, the realtor fees and stuff like that. But who cares as long as you can get a great deal. We got if it still home. works out, it's good. Exactly. We have other wholesalers. We have multiple ways of finding deals. Are, you know, what other ways would you say are effective in finding the deals? Are we missing anything? Like what's working for you right now? Honestly, I do a lot of them through, I have a lot of realtors that I know that they, they get, basically when someone calls them up and says, hey, I want to sell this property, there's some of them that they'll look at the property like this place is a dump. Let me just call Steve and see if he'll buy the thing for me. And then because they know they can't sell it on the open market. So I have a lot of realtors that contact me. Um, I have some CPAs, some accountants that have contacted me and they're like, hey, one of my clients, you know, he has this portfolio. He needs to do whatever for, you know, tax reasons or whatever. Exactly. You know, they're, they're, we're getting ready to retire. They just want to get rid of some things. And I've had CPAs, I've had lawyers, all people that, you know, I try to build contacts and that's probably one of the best things you can do is go out there and meet and network with people. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean just like, you know, like them on Facebook, you know, that's not, you know, truly meeting and knowing people, but you get people's cell phone numbers and you start talking to these people, you email them, you text them and don't harass them, but be there for them. So that when they have a problem, whether it's that lawyer or that accountant, they need to solve something for their client. If you can be the fix for them, they're going to keep bringing you deals. That's you know, right. if you contact them and say, you know, Mr. Lawyer, please help me. I want deals. They're not there to help you. They're there to help their client. And if you can help them help their client, they're going to love you. Absolutely, man. So you find properties. What's the next step um, to getting the deal actually closed. So we, we have the property now, Mm -hmm. you know, say we purchase a property from a, I don't know, another investor. We got a great deal. What do we do? Right. Okay. Depends if you want to move in and fix it up. You kind of have two different angles. Um, most for me, I don't move into the properties, but getting started, I would, if it was just a first time deal, this your first one, I would, you know, you've got your offer. You're going to be, your plan is I'm going to move into it. Mm -hmm. So you, Contact your title agency, find who you're going to do your closing with, uh, speak with your, you know, your peers that are in your area, people you work with. If you bought this deal from another investor, talk to him or her and say, hey, who is really good at doing the, the title work? Who's really good at doing closing? I'm new at this. And, you know, ask them, say, hey, I, I don't know how to do this closing. It, it sounds complicated. And a lot of times these people that they're in there, they'll be like, yeah, call Johnny, call Susie. You know, these people will help you. Yeah. And a lot of times I think people get all freaked out that, oh my, you know, closing is going to be so complicated. It's really simple. The title agency and escrow, they do all the work for you. 
you know, you're going to have a bunch of papers to sign. Big whoop de do. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, it, so many people get all wrapped up and almost every single deal without exception has something at the very last minute that's, you know, worst case and something horrible. Just pause and realize that just about anything that comes up at the closing table can very easily be fixed. Maybe it costs a teeny bit more money and we're talking a few hundred, maybe a few thousand in the long run. If you own that property for 10, 15, 30 years, that's such a little blip. And so many people get all worked up and they're like, oh my God, the, you know, the, the seller didn't fix the toilet and the toilet's leaking. They whoop de do pull out the toilet, put in a new wax ring, put a new toilet down, move on with life. You know, I, I've seen so many that they get so stressed over that, that, you know, find a, a good, you know, mentor or find somebody that's in the industry that knows a good closing company and just almost sit back. It's not complicated and they do the work for you. Absolutely, man. So when you're, I guess, uh, when you find properties, obviously we want to get it to the closing. What are some of the things that you're looking for when you analyze the deal to make sure it's a good deal? Sure. It, it, depending on how I'm going with the property, I'm going to look at the rentals in the area. So if this is going to be a rental property, I'm, you, know, you so, can either so, go for a flips or you're going right. Okay. Let's pause there for a second. Sorry about that, man. So when you're, when you're analyzing the rentals in the area, how are you finding that information? Sure. So if I'm going to keep this as a rental, then I start looking at what are the other units that are similar in the area renting for. So I'll drive up and down the street. And if I see a sign saying for rent, I call them up and say, Hey, I see you got this place for rent. What is it? You know, what's it like? What's the cost? You know, is this a good near? And just pretend like you're going to rent the place from them. Ask them some questions. You know, are there any problems? When is the trash picked up in this block? You know, are there any crime issues? You know, is it a good neighborhood for my kids? Just ask general questions. Uh, of course, they're going to usually tell you favorable things. They're not going to tell you the bad stuff, right, right. but at least it gives you a little picture of the neighborhood. And then you say, okay, I see that, you know, there's 10 other units in this area that all rent for $500 for, a, you know, a one bedroom or, you know, 1250 for, you know, a, a two bedroom, whatever that the rents are in the area. Then I sit down and I add up my numbers and say, okay, I know that I can rent for X dollars. I usually will rent for slightly less than the market. Right. And so if normally the market can, is, could, you know, favor a, a $1,200 rent, I might do 11. The reason for that is I'm going to get a ton of applicants that are going to submit. And then I can be picky on who I select. If I rent my properties at exactly $1,200, I'm the going rate. So I'm only going to get people that are willing to put up with the going rate, but mm -hmm. I like to price it under the market and then be much more selective. So when I'm penciling out these deals, I know, okay, I've got three units. I could rent them out for $1,100. Okay. Let me add up my numbers here. I know that my mortgage payment's going to be this. I know that my utility payments are going to be this. I know that, you know, the trash bill is going to be this, you know, all the different things you have to add up. And then I look at it and say, okay, I know that once all my bills are paid here for these, you know, three units that I'm renting out, I know that I'm going to put an extra $500 in my pocket or an extra thousand dollars in my pocket every month. To me, that's less important. It depends on what type of investor you are. I don't normally invest for cash flow. I love cash flow. <laughs> How could you not love cash flow? But I'm looking at the long-term value. So I look at it as, okay, if every month there's 500 bucks that comes in, I put that into a savings account, basically. I don't spend that money. It's just there if, you know, poop hits the fan and I need to fix something, I don't have to pull out my own money. It's right. basically the tenants have already paid for it for me. And that's how I, I pencil in all these things. And I say, okay, I know there'll be an extra $500 or $700 per month. I'll put that in savings. You know, I'm looking at the place. I know the roof is good for another 10 years. Okay, good. I know that the air conditioner is probably going to be good for another three, five years. Okay, good. You know, or, oh, I'm going to have to put in a new roof. All right, well, how much is that going to cost? So then these are all the things that I'm figuring out before I actually go buy the property. Let me stop you right there. That's such an important, important, I got it. This is a, this is definitely a moment we have to talk about right now. So here's the deal, guys. A lot of people get into investing and they forget that this is called investing for a reason, right? You want to make sure that your, your investment is going to grow. It's going to take care of you. And it shouldn't yep. be your end all be all. 
right? So here's, here's why I'm bringing this up. So important. I'm so happy you mentioned this. A lot of people don't like their day job. And a lot of it is because of the way real estate investing is marketed by gurus, right? Quit yeah. your day job, do, you know, never have to work for your boss again, yada, yada, yada. All right. But I would it, never quit my day job. <laughs> that's my point. In real life, People have to keep income coming in, okay? Yep. It's difficult to start a business when you don't have a lot of money. So first of all, keep your day job until you feel like you, you can leave because there's a difference. That's my point. There's a difference between having to go to a job and needing to go to a job. You need to go right. when you don't have income or when that's your only source of income for your household, right? Right. But if you have investment properties, all of a sudden you have this income coming in, you're able to save money, you're able, the investment property pays for itself. Now you have a choice. You don't have to go to the job. You go because uh, it, it changes the scenario, man. Um, it does. When, when, you, when you have extra money coming in from investing, from properties that you own and it's paying for itself, right? And you know that you have this slush fund on the side, you start looking at your actual job. Not that I, you know, personally, I did it the hard way. I've never had a job before. I've always been mm -hmm. self-employed. But you look at things differently when, you, uh, when, when you're in a position, your job looks that much better when you have extra money coming in, right? Now it's like, hey, exactly, I'm just and it's no longer the stress of having to get up and go to work because technically, at any moment, you could just say, "Well, screw this, I'm done." Exactly. So things things change. You might start appreciating, you know, I, you know, I have a I have one student that works in Walmart, and mm -hmm. she's doing investing on the side. And at the end of the day, when investing starts to take over. And she's making more money from investing than she is in Walmart. She can decide, hey, I, I still want yeah, to. And, and I did the exact same thing. And I, I love how you brought that up that when I started and I was working for those other investors, my day job was I was the assistant manager at Best Buy. Yeah. That's what my job was. That paid my bills. Working for the investors made me a couple extra hundred bucks here or there. But you know, it wasn't until I was out there and I had two years of these deals and it got to the point where actually I was losing money by working that that's when I actually stopped working. For exactly. Life. That's when you make the choice to leave. And that's a decision that you can make. You can personally make a conscious decision uh, whether you want to work or not because you're making more money from your investment at that point. So I can't, exactly. stand it. I, I can't take it when people say, Hey, I'm going to leave my job and go full force in a real estate. It's like, why? <laughs> you know, that's it's horrible. Insane. You know, you know, like for me, my day job, yes, I own the tech company, but that's my actual salary that I get. Mm -hmm. And the way that my accounting is set up, my tech job, obviously it's its own business. I get a W2, you know, I get a paycheck every two weeks, actually. Hey, tomorrow's payday. Um, you know, I get a paycheck like every employee at the business there. It's W2. Then my investments that I do are is a completely separate side of my life. Right. And I just let the investments just keep building and generating more and more money. And I live off of my salary. That's right, man. And, and I have the luxury of owning that business as well. But, you know, from a effective standpoint, I go to work five days a week and I get a paycheck just like everybody else. Man, this is, that was such a key point, such an important point that I really want everyone who's, who's watching this up to this point, really think about what we just spoke about. If you're working right now, don't hate your job. Don't, you know, if yep. you have a boss, that's fine. Put yourself in a position to where you can make a decision if you want to stay there or not. But maybe you like your job. Maybe you don't like it because you feel like you're not making enough money or you used to like it at some point and it, uh, became a burden to you because of the, the the money issue. The real estate investing can change that, but you'll give yourself options when you, you know, when when you're investing. Exactly. You're you're basically opening the doors for yourself to be able to uh, have more options and still be able to do what it is that you want to do, or uh, still work at your job if that's what you want to do at the end of the day. Um, and, and now you have the power. 
you know, as opposed to right now, if it, you know, let's take investing off the table for a moment. You're just a, you know, a Monday through Friday, nine to five or whatever your hours are, but just, you know, you get a normal job. You're at the mercy of the employer and the economy, you know? So I understand that stress. And I understand the online gurus that tell you, leave that job and go do investing. But, you know, like you were saying here that do both, you know, Mm -hmm. keep that job and, you know, ride it till its wheels fall off, you know, as long as they're willing to continue to pay you and you're making, doesn't matter, even if it's minimum wage, you're getting money in every month and start building up your, you know, your portfolio, take Mm -hmm. the money from your portfolio, reinvest it into getting more properties, make sure money's in your account. So if a tenant can't pay rent for the month, you're not SOL. You know, that's one of the worst things that could happen is you quit your job at Best Buy or McDonald's or Walmart or, you know, Microsoft or IBM. It doesn't matter. You can have a huge, large job or a small job. Keep that money coming in. And then as you start building it up and you look at your bank account, and you're like, hmm, let me check my bank account. Oh, okay. I have a quarter million dollars in cash sitting in there. Okay. Maybe you don't need to work at Walmart anymore. You have the options, but right. I would be terrified, you know, when I worked at Best Buy, I was terrified to leave my job then. And I was, you know, this is uh, 2003 when I left Best Buy. And, you know, at the time, I think I was making like $33,000 a year at Best Buy. But I was making over about $100,000, 150000 a year on my um on my flips. And it was like, I still was terrified to leave the Best Buy yeah, job because yeah. that was guaranteed money. It's funny that you mentioned Best Buy. My camera guy who does all of my video editing, he works mm-hmm. in Best Buy. So he makes more money being my camera guy than he does in Best Buy. So I told yes. him a couple months ago, I said, look, you had an option. You know, you can put more time into building your business and decide to leave if you want, which I thought at that point was the best thing for him to do. Or you can stay mm-hmm. there and have benefits for, you know, Best Buy and stuff like that. But I think- right. he, hindering himself by a whole, he was basically holding himself back uh, from what he can fully accomplish. Yeah. And and there's, I I 100% agree. There's a certain point where you realize, okay, you know, in the beginning, you need to keep that job. It's guaranteed money. Then you get to the point where you're like, wait a second, I'm making a lot more money on the side than I'm making at my day job. Right now it's safe for you to leave that day job. Exactly. Very important point, man. I'm glad we had this discussion about that, man. So uh, we spoke about finding properties. We know how to analyze them. Uh, We were talking about rents and, you know, making sure that the numbers work before we make the offer. Are you buying, uh, are you using the the same analytical calculations as you would on a commercial property to a, let's say down to a two to four unit? Are you buying, you know, how how are you making your offer based off of rent and and, and, uh, expenses? Well, I try, you know, first of all, I'm horrible in math, just as a general thing. So I try to keep all my calculations simple. And the way I look at it is if I can't do it on a piece of paper, and I'm a computer geek, but if I can't do the math on a piece of paper, then it's way too complex for me. You know, I love spreadsheets, but I know there's some incredibly complex spreadsheets that you enter in some numbers and it does a bunch of stuff for you. And I think the problem with that is people then they're just trusting that that computer is telling them the right answer. Mm -hmm. So when I look at it, it's literally, it's a piece of paper next to me and I scribble, here's how I cost, here's what I'm gonna pay every month, here's how much money is coming in. And then I look at it and say, okay, I know I've got the 500. We already said all this stuff. I'm just hitting the quick summary. I know the amount of money that's coming in. So I'm gonna make my offer to the, you know, the current owner based upon if I'm doing seller financing, I know how much I can buy it from him over a 10 year note or a 15 year note. Right. Or if I'm going to be buying it from, you know, buying it with a bank, then you have to start thinking on the way that the bank looks at it. Mm -hmm. And when you start getting into five and above, it is a completely different world. So we won't even bother talking about that at the moment. Um, The one to four unit the bank looks at it basically as simple. It's the simplest formula they basically look at. Yeah. What is your overall cost that you have, your debt to income ratio? So how much money do you owe to your other credit cards? Can you pay their payment from your current income of your job and the rent? It's really simple numbers. So if you have, for easy numbers, you have $2,000 coming in every month and you're already spending a thousand of it on something else, they're not going to finance you on the rest of the deal. But if they look at, 
Go ahead. I was say, just saying debt to income ratio. That's all it is. Exactly. Your debt to income ratio. So if you're going to go through the, the bank for the property, that gets a little bit more complex. I personally love doing the seller financed where I don't have to worry about any of that. I know what I'm going to pay the um, actual owner of the property or the seller of the property, what I'm going to pay them every month. And I'll get a 15 year or a 30 year note from them. Yeah. I'll keep the property for a year up, you know, maybe up to two years, but at least one year. Then I go to my local bank, go to a credit union, whatever, and say, hey, I already own this property. Here's how much money it makes. They will easily refinance you without having to worry about anything. That's right. That is the simplest way to get the bank loan. In the beginning, you got to prove everything. Yeah. Exactly. And they don't care anymore. None of the numbers really matter. Yeah. It's just when you go to buy it, that it's like this, you know, they, the bank wants you to prove that you know how to manage the place, mm -hmm. basically. Once you've had it for a year and they look at it and say, okay, here's your costs. Here's how much you brought in. Cool. We'll finance it. Here's your check. And yeah. refinancing is the simplest way to do it. Much easier to refi than it is to, uh, to, to buy new. Because you have to exactly. trust with the bank, you know, they, you know, yep. I don't, you know, they, they basically want to make sure that you're credit worthy at that point. But when you own it already, they're just trying to get your business at that point. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So you do the seller for, for me. I love the seller financing where I will put almost nothing down or you can bring in an investor if you need something down. However, you work that out, keep the place for one year because the bank's Almost no banks will finance it if you've owned it less than a year mm -hmm. for a refinance. That's right. Um, own it for at least a year. Show them your tax return saying, here's how much money I made off of it. You will easily refinance that property and it's very simple. Yeah, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. So we found the property. We analyzed. Now are you buying, let's say you're bringing in that $500 a month based off of the example we used. Uh, that's, right. what is that? Sixty. That's $6,000 a year, is it? 12 times five is six. Yeah. $6,000 a year, are you buying like 10 times the rent roll, eight times the rent roll? Like how are you calculating your offer? Uh, usually about six. Six times six times the rent roll. Yeah, it, 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 the thing is it depends in each city because I do buy in a couple different areas. Some areas demand higher than others based upon, you know, how valuable that area is. Is it an up and coming area or is it like Detroit that, you know, is kind of had its heyday and is, oh, is going to take a while until it's up and coming again. Mm -hmm. But so it, you're some places you're not going to be able to choose what you, 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 you know, you pay for it. It's going to be, here's the going rate for this area based upon the multiple right. either cash on cash or whatever you want to calculate it with. And you got to look at other properties to be able to determine that pretty much. So exactly. Yeah, you and that's kind of that. hard to summarize in like a 30 second little blip, exactly. but exactly. So technically you don't necessarily want to take, I mean, you want to take the income and the expenses that's going to leave you with the NOI and then turn around and multiply that by, let's say you're using six to, uh, to figure out your purchase price pretty much. Right. And my overall goal, I care a lot more on the appreciation than what I'm getting from my rents. Excellent. I want my rents to cover my bills and put a little extra in the kitty just to basically, I know I'm going to need to replace the roof or air yeah. conditioner. I know the money's already there. The tenants have basically paid for it for me. I'm caring more about, you know, how much is this neighborhood appreciating? How much has it over the past five years, 10 years? What's the prediction? Will it continue over the next five years? Are there good jobs in this area? Or are all the jobs leaving that type of thing? Excellent, man. This has been a great, great call, man. A lot of nuggets. Uh, if you guys haven't picked those nuggets up, you definitely need to go back. Listen to this again, because there's a lot of small detail that we spoke about Maybe you didn't catch it, but as experienced real estate investors, we know um, that this is the stuff that you need to know in order to really uh, get from where you are right now to where you want to go in real estate. So I really want to thank you for, for uh, taking the time to jump on the line today. Uh, hey, it was spoke, great. Spoke about a little bit of a lot of different things, right? And it's, been a, it's definitely been a, a fun time uh, talking real estate investing in general, specifically two to four unit investing. A lot of different ways to find properties. We spoke about analyzing them. We spoke about closing them as well. Three simple steps, guys. Find, analyze, close the deal, and then decide on what you want to do from there. Um, obviously, we can't cover everything in, in, in under an hour. Uh, right. If our listeners wanted to uh, get in contact with you, uh, how should they do that? Uh, I, I know that you have a YouTube channel. 
Maybe you guys can go to uh, St- the Stephen Carlson show on YouTube. But what are some some other ways that uh, our listeners can get in contact with you, Stephen? Yeah, they can either check out um, my two YouTube channels. There's the Stephen Carlson show you talked about. I have a second one I just launched yesterday that's called Fat Boy Fitness. It's about getting my fat rear end back in shape. So that channel's on YouTube as well. And then they can also go to my website, which is Mm carlsoninc.com. And um, they'll be able to contact me through that way if they've got any questions or they can also contact through you. And also Instagram. I know you have an Instagram page as well. I'll, I'll link all. Yeah, of that. I need to use. I need to use that more often. But yeah, it's there. I just I don't use it too much. But yeah, it's there. <laughs> gotcha. Now listen, guys. I'm gonna link all of Stevens' uh, information in the description box. I like that name, Fat Boy Fitness. That's a clever name, man. That's, hey, that's, you know, I'm trying to get my tubby butt back in shape. So you gotta check it out. Up, the man. first video launched last night. I'm gonna go check that out. I'm, I'm gonna, that's gonna blow up, man. Watch. But uh, uh, definitely looking forward to doing this again with you. Uh, you guys, let me know if you have any questions for Steven. We'll do another call, and uh, maybe we'll do a Q&A style video with him. But uh, That'd be great. Let me know what you guys, uh, what questions you guys have for Steven. I'll get him back on the line. We can do this again and, and have some fun. Uh, make sure that you check out Steven's channels. Uh, and also, uh, be sure to reach out to him. Let, let him know that you uh, uh, check out his YouTube channel. Uh, his uh, Stephen Carlson show on YouTube. Let him know that you uh, you came from uh, Jamel uh, Jamel's podcast, and um, Stephen will definitely take care of you guys. Now, listen, um, I know you're uh, you're into a lot of uh, different things, Stephen. Are you reading any particular books right now at all? No, honestly, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. No, not really. Hey, I, I appreciate the honest answer, man. It's fine. Um, I'm going to make sure I, what, what's your favorite book of all time? Ah, uh, let's think here. I have one. I did. Uh, there was one I read about two months ago and I'm trying to remember its exact title. It was from, um, Navy SEAL. I'm just horrible with names. It was it, um, um, the di- dichotomy of leadership. The economy of leadership. Yep. And it was, uh, trying to remember the SEAL's name. Um, since I was in the Navy, I love SEAL. Sorry. Is it, but, um, is it economy of leader? Is it, what would you say it was? No, it's the, um, hold on. I can tell you exactly. Dichotomy of leadership. Dichotomy of leadership. I'm going to look that up on Amazon and I'll link that in a, and, and, um, there's another Navy SEAL guy, David Goggins. You ever heard of him? Yes. Um, I'll link those books. I'll find a dichotomy of leadership in the, uh, let me jot that down, by the way. Dichotomy of Leadership. Yep, and Extreme Ownership was the second book, I think. And it was from uh, Jocko Willick was the name of the seal. You said Extreme Ownership? Extreme Ownership. And um, the name of the author is Jocko Willick. W-I-L-L-I-N-K. I'm going to check those two books out and link them in the uh, description box for you. Yeah, guys. I read them about two, two, three months ago. They were great books. And they teach you from the Navy SEALs perspective, but it's, it's all about how you can take the core concepts that they've learned as commanders and warfare and use it in business. And, and it's, it's great reads. Excellent. Excellent, man. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, uh, talking with you again. Stephen, any last words for our listeners, man? No, man, I think we covered an awful lot. So let's uh, let their brain rest a little bit. And if you got any questions, they can reach out to me. They can reach out to you. And I'm sure we can take care of them. Sounds good, brother. I definitely appreciate your time. Listen, guys, like this video. Subscribe to this channel if you're watching it on YouTube. Uh, if you're not and you're on the podcast, be sure to leave a review. Um, I appreciate that. Leave a rating as well. And I will talk to you guys on the next one. Talk to you later. Take care.